Welcome to the podcast of data and analytics in business. We will learn from the leading industry experts using data and analytics to solve the problems and create values in practice. We will also learn where the industry is heading to and how data and analytics will shape the industry in the future. Most importantly, how they are preparing their business for digital transformation and disruption in the future. I am your host, Jason Tan, and thank you for listening. In this episode, we have got Dr. Alex M. Ting. He is a trusted and experienced data science leader with a proven track record in delivering innovative, successful, and sustainable projects in government, industry, and startup that leverage data and deep learning capability to deliver actionable insight. Alex has come from the commercial background. He has experience working in those space, so it's really refreshing to see how someone is moving from the commercial to government and finally to academic. It's rather unusual career path, and I trust you will enjoy the interview that I have got here with him. Now, apology for the quality of this. Podcast. The recording quality is a little bit horrible. However, do pay attention to the content, and I believe you are going to learn a lot. It is great pressure to have Alex to hear about his mission to train the next generation data scientists. Enjoy. Hi, Alex. It has been long talking about having you on the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great to speak to you today. Good to have you on the podcast, and I think it will be really exciting that considering of your background of uh, how you are changing your career path from working in the industry, then moved to the government, and then now you are working in the academy. I think that is a really interesting path. Um, but before we go and talk details about that, how about you start telling us a little bit about where you're from, what you currently do, and what is your main focus and what is the role that you play at the organization that you work for at the moment? Sure, happy to do so. I'm currently an academic at the Australian National University in Canberra in Australia, and in, within the ANU I sit in the College of Engineering and Computer Science. Overall, I'd say my key focus is within two parts. One is teaching, the training the next generation of data scientists and software engineers. The other part is focused on translational research, the transforming data science technology which delivers public good via various research and engagement programs that I'm involved in. Overall, my role includes a number of factors. There's the aspect of convening courses and teaching, such as NLP, the big one teaching at the moment. I'm also the co-convener for our bachelor's and master's of applied data, data analytics schools, which is equivalent to um, what many other universities offer by way of data science and broader analytics master's programs. Being an academic, I also do quite a bit of research and supervision, a um, number of areas of research, including confidential computing, NLP, and graph analytics. And also one of the more exciting parts is part of the leadership team helping set up a new institute at the ANU known as the Software Innovation Institute. This is quite interesting. I've had a lot of people chat to me about this recently. It's focused on us looking at new and innovative ways to research, teaching, and outreach into society. And the key focus is looking at translational research and data science and fostering engineering into uh, real-world applications. And in the process, we want to find new ways of educating students to be better exposed to how actual professionals work in this space. So we're trying to use various ideas like what the medical profession uses in teaching hospitals to translate some of this into setting software engineering and data science education on a new path. Because students often are not exposed enough throughout their studies to how an actual professional environment works, so we're trying to bridge that gap. And by doing so, we're trying to deliver state-of-the-art teaching programs, um, world-leading work, integrated learning. If anyone's keen to learn more about this, want to learn more, just please get in touch with me. And apart from that, I, I run meetups, mentor, blog, speak at conferences and forums, and generally just try and help the data science community as much as I can. Absolutely. I uh, will also put up your details and your LinkedIn profile on the blog so that people can get in touch with you. Well, you were talking about the Institute of Analytics and also helping the student to provide the research to helping the private organization into improving their business using analytics and data science and engineering. I was thinking that this has always been part of what the university is trying to do, but often it seems like the university may focus a little bit too much of the research and while the 
commercial organization, they tend to need the quicker result to it to be able to translate into those research into result because they just don't have all the time in the world. So I suppose in that sense, what would you say you or this Institute of Analytics would be doing differently to close that gap to ensure that both sides of the world can benefit from this? Yeah, great question, Jason. I know what you mean. Often there's this, there can be this tug of war where on the academic side you have to obviously publish and pursue those various academic-related interests, whereas on the industry side you need to very much be results-focused. So from our, from our perspective, we're very much focused on using that research that we develop in a translational way so we can translate that research into clear, direct goals for organisations to make their strategic goals and needs. And a part of that is is to really work alongside industry partners and students to make sure the focus is always on, on those strategic needs, to make sure that we deliver results first and foremost for our clients and engagement partners. But in doing so, come up with new techniques and methods such that everyone's um, goals are met. We, we, we can clearly see that there's going to be a lot of opportunity to develop new approaches that allow us to still publish and come up with new innovative research, which is you know, one of the main goals of an academic institution, but not in a negative way that, that, that impacts industry. So we want to make sure that we can do that alongside our industry partners and work together rather than individually to make sure that that research benefits them in such a way that all their goals are met and that they understand that from get-go we're there to help solve their problems first and foremost rather than anything else. So I think there's definitely a lot of opportunity and in the process, I think we'll, we'll learn from that and it'll be an interesting process and we'll see what the best model is for, for engaging. And I think as long as everyone knows from the outset what the clear goals are, that together we can work and do some great, great work together. Absolutely. It sounds like you are setting up a framework and you are going to continue fine-tuning this framework to help ensure closing that gap in bridging the both sides of the world. So I, I think that sounds like an exciting plan that you do understand the challenges before going into that area. So I think definitely we'll, while keeping an eye on this area. So it sounds like you, is it fair to say that your current focus is to training the next generation of data scientists, which is quite different to your past career? Would, that, would you say that is your current focus? Definitely one key, one key part of it and one of the drivers behind the teaching hospital component of this new software innovation institute we're developing. I feel strongly that it's important to help students not just understand the fundamentals and the theory that we teach them, but to also understand how to apply the theory in being able to develop new techniques and solve real world problems. They also need to learn alongside that all the soft skills that are important to building a theory, which isn't traditionally taught. So a key component of what I do when I'm teaching and what we'll be doing through the Institute with the project the students work on is really helping instill the importance and, and the breadth of a lot of these skills that they need to develop and learn alongside the theory. So this can include, you know, strong communication skills, skills to actually work alongside the business to understand their problems and their pain points, being able to develop flexibility and pragmatism with approaches to tools and methods and, build and you know, methods they use to actually work. So on the academic side when students are learning, they typically only work on toy or fake problems while studying. It's understandable and makes it easier to, to teach and to learn these theories. But they can often be surprised when they enter the workforce how different what they've learned and been doing is that is it, you know, when you actually start working in the real world you realise the data can be quite messy, it can be sparse, it can be difficult to work with. They're not just nice clean data sets. Often students will come out having learnt various neural network approaches and you face to an Excel spreadsheet as opposed to some you know, fantastic new neural networks that they were hoping that they'd actually get to work on. <laughs> they'd they'd realised that the business problems aren't always clearly defined or stated, so there's a lot of upfront work and actually talking to the, to the you know, clients and the business side on what they, what's the actual problem, what can be done sometimes, and most often the simplest solutions can often be the best, but you start off simple, then you add complexity rather than jump to the most complicated and fantastic new approach available. So this is something I really want to address by the Institute and by my general approach to teaching to make sure that there's this mentoring component included because I've come from industry so I can help them understand how to better transition from their academic studies out into the real world. So 
yeah, that's, that's a real big focus in mind and something that I've been doing since I've been back and something that students have been very receptive of and appreciated a great deal. But also on that, I should add that what we've already done is through our master's program and master's data analytics, I mentioned that we recognise that data science is only one component of typically what deep learning analytics will do out, out in the real world. So we want to make sure that they understand not just the specific skills within data science, but in the entire analytics pipeline. So what, what I've noticed happening in the past year or two, especially in government, is that there's this notion appearing of an, enter, of an enter, enterprise analytics group that are being set up and it's approaching government and some private sector organisations where they realise also that data science is one key component because we need people with strong data skills, we need people with software engineering skills, especially when you're embedding products modelled into production. We need people to understand the data wrangling, databases, etc. So people are starting to see this as an overall analytics pipeline, the data science is one part of that. So we're trying to to make sure the students understand that and that there's different roles that can walk into this data science specific there's elements of that, there's software engineering, and that these are all there. They're just one part of the chain because you're there to do one purpose, and that is to, to ensure that data drives actionable insights to meet particular goals of the organisation. So we try and instill that early in the students when they're working on problems and then venturing out into the career force, especially when they're in their penultimate year or they're doing masters or PhD. That's been something that's in really helping them um, find jobs that they actually want and to a better understand of how their learning is actually being used in various fields, including startups, government and industry. And that's been going really well for them. From your personal perspective, what do you see as the major challenges towards this girl? Is it more about instilling those elements and those attributes towards the student that the outcome of their job is not purely relying on the input of, of the data science skills that they play, i.e. building the model, but the reality is much, much bigger than that. And also the human side of the world within the organization, how do they interact and how do they sell the idea? Do you see that? Is that your main challenge, do you think, or what are the challenges that you see? Yeah, fair point. I think there's a number of challenges that we all face related to that. So on the academic side, one of the challenges we often face is encouraging good students to undertake postgraduate studies, their masters and PhDs, rather than go straight into industry, because many of these are unlikely to return. We can understand from their perspective why venturing directly into industry is a good way to build skills and financially set yourself up. But we've also seen, especially in certain technologies, that various advancements are being made. Um, we need you know, a lot of really strong researchers to really help underpin that and come up with new techniques. So, the students that are really eager and really strong, we think they'll pick up some of that rigor in the industry. We like to convince them to at least try and consider um, postgraduate studies before they move on to, to really help build up those skills further. It's very difficult to do that out in industries, have that academic rigor behind you and so you know, taking this strong role models. So it's one of the ones faces challenges that we often face, but yeah, we actively work on that and by going, doing various talks and having industry guest speakers come in, we, we feel that a lot of these students actually become much more excited to consider pursuing further research and support in their skills, which, yeah, which has been great to see. There's also the other aspect of missing junior and aspiring data scientists, for instance, to, to learn the various fundamentals at a deeper level, not just do a short course and pick up some basic coding in R and Python and then go out and, and think they know everything they, they need to know in, in building you know, various machine learning model and deep learning model. It's really key for them to, to understand how these things work under the hood, strengths and weaknesses, what to apply and when, and, and to have a bit more rigor behind them. And they map that to coding perspective. Beyond just the students and data scientists themselves, there's also this challenge around trying to demystify some of these approaches in, in AI and machine learning and to get people to think beyond the hype and for them to focus on you know, the fundamental skills and knowledge that the staff need to have when they're employing people, speaking to people they want to engage with. At the end of the day, it's really about enabling data-driven action insights, understanding that you know, no matter what new technique is out there, that is it, you know, they need to be asking, is it really fit for purpose? So there's a lot of education I think, that has to happen at all levels within industry. We're also actively working on it, and that's been really good. It's good to see that people are keen to learn more and to understand beyond the the hype that they read about. 
another challenge I think that we face is just buying from industry in terms of, say, for instance, with the institute, the same Atlantic students be part of these teams that have tangible outcomes. Often students are interns; they they work kind of on the on the outskirts of various problems. They're not really sitting deep within an actual program or unit which has direct outcomes with you know specific timelines that they need to deliver on. We believe we're very and strong academic insight and strong mentors in the industry that will really be able to, to make that transition much smoother for, for students to go out through those pathways that we're creating into industry and for industry to see them as a great model to, to test the students and, and to help you know, bring some of that information back into helping further develop our courses and training programs, which I think will be great long term. I want to give a bit of context and a background about you and why you are the right person in doing this, why you are bringing a different perspective into this whole idea in, and also the way of training the student and instilling uh, all those different insights to the student. So you have worked at the commercial company like the hedge funds, the invest, investment bank as a uh, quant before. You have worked with the insurer in the actual department doing the marketing analytics. Then you move into consulting and the government agency and work there to, to build up the analytic capability and delivering the analytic data science project before. And finally, you are now in the academy. So that is quite unusual to the mainstream progression. So I have read your interview in the past, so I can understand why the personal perspective of that. But at, your, at a high level and in your experience, what would you tell people the major differences when working for the commercial company versus the government agency and the academy? Yeah, sure. Um, you're right that my career path has been a bit different to some, and people often point that out. It's a bit more unusual when you compare it to the usual traje- trajectory that people are on. One looks more like a back propagation, I think. Um, <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> that's right. People tend, as you say, to move more from academia to industry. In places like Canberra, you'll often do that by government. You think about wanting to build a career in government, for instance. However, I've enjoyed all the different domains I've worked in and learned a lot from that. And so one of the earlier questions, why I'm moving to, why take this bus move back into academia? It's really, I guess, a number of reasons. Mainly, I had this, I'd been planning to go back into academia for a while for the right opportunity for a number of reasons. Well, yeah, I have to elaborate on. So an opportunity came up to work at alongside a college that I greatly respect. He's one of the best data scientists and data science leaders in the country, in my opinion, named Keith Young Zoom. With an opportunity to help shape and guide this new data science and software engineering program, um, Australia's leading uni. Couldn't say no, I thought this is just too good, too good to, to refuse. And I thought with that comes this notion of academic freedom, especially in relation to intellectual pursuits. So I was thinking, I get an opportunity to help students, government, industry along the way. I mean, what more, what more could I want? I also miss teaching. Um, I was doing quite a bit of teaching at an industry and government. I wanted to do more. It's a play more of a, a serious role in helping educate this next generation of data scientists and software engineers. And I saw this opportunity to really help bridge the gap between academia and industry that we talked about earlier by leveraging my experience gained across these multiple um, industries and domains throughout my career. And also, I thought it's a great opportunity to get back into research, academic you know, mentoring and helping set up not only the the new institute, but it's helping students and the university see the industry and government more as, as partners and collaborators in a lot of the work we do um, rather than be business partners. I thought there's so much more we can do together to really build the capability of what's happening in the country and even further than that. So that's been really good. That has been a key challenge. I guess the main challenge that people don't always think about is when you want to transition back into academia, you've been in industries like I have where there's a lot of IT and security around what you do. You can't easily published, so getting back into a new area where you have to build up a you know, publication, a research profile again after a long hiatus is, is quite challenging, but it's been fun because I get to now dabble in a new few areas that I've become interested in throughout my career, and I've got the freedom and the support to do that with students and colleagues, and, and that, that's been really fascinating. To your second point, you talk about main differences. I'm happy to speak about some of the ones that I've seen across these different industries. In my perspective, they really come down to, I guess, culture and senses. The good thing is, I think throughout my career, I've seen it's become much easier for people to transition between industries because the industry is much more willing to, to look at people's transferable skills rather than the 
first to name that knowledge that they gain in a particular industry, say insurance or a particular sector of the government. So these transferable skills, especially in data science and analytics areas, received very well these days from both sides, both public and private. So we strongly encourage people to really play up those skills and show what are those skills that are clearly related to the value they can bring to an organisation. It's not blow so much about where you come from or where you're going, but just to focus on the value that you can and want to add. But from the academic side, I feel like my current role is kind of the best of them all. I get to do research, teach, mentor, I still advise and consult when I collaborate with industry and government to help them deliver actual and science. So to me, it's kind of the best of all worlds. I'm still working with government close to industry, but I'm also very in academia and have that freedom I mentioned and in my work with some great, fantastic, intelligent people that I can continually learn from. So that's been a huge plus for me, really exciting. From the industry perspective, I guess in many ways I found that the strategic goals can be clearer and sometimes easier to measure compared to other industries, like you know, increasing profits. A lot of these private companies have to do you know, for their shareholders, which we all understand. So they typically tend to be more results focused. But sometimes it can be quick and easy to get certain things done. You have less bureaucracy and hierarchy getting your way. From the personal perspective of an employee, it can be easier to, to make money. You know, you don't go into academia government to, to make money, obviously, but if that's one of your aims, of course, the private sector is great for that. There's a lot of you know, upside for that. It's you know, fantastic to see we're sharing that. And they also tend to be, the organisations tend to be less risk averse. So that goes back to it just being a little bit easier sometimes to get things done. And that's something I noticed throughout my time in, you know, in some of the big investment banks and uh, uh, the insurance sector as well, where there's a lot of um, freedom you have if you believe in something you made a good business case, but they'll support you. I'll get behind you to, to you know, try and make something happen to get into a new, to a new market or to develop a new product. And that's, yeah, that's something that isn't um, always easy to find elsewhere. You know, on the government side, in the area I've enjoyed for the past six or so years and still heavily involved in, I find that a lot of the problems tend to be quite broad and challenging. The notion of doing public and social good is really what drove me initially from going through from industry into government and now into academia where I can still do a lot of that social good work. That's a huge value of mine that I'm really passionate about. The key focus tends to be the focus, the focus um, is the notion of improving public services given we're you know, accountable to the taxpayers of government organisations. So that's meant to be different to, to other industries. I must add that there's often this misconception that people haven't worked in government that government sector can sometimes lag industry with speed of uptake of new technologies. We obviously can't compare them to tech companies, but with a different focus. But to be honest, some of the best data science teams I've worked in or managed have actually been in the government sector. But there's a lot of pockets of excellence mm. in the areas where they have you know, really strong people, really focused on, on delivering really good value to, to the broader public. And they have a lot of support from senior management to do that. But you know, some people do see sometimes due to understandable reasons like security, governance, etc. The governance around what we do in government that it can be a bit slower to get things done. Uh, but I've also seen that in large private organisations. You know, there's, there's always a legitimate reason for that. On the upside, you know, people tend to talk about this, this work-life balance thing you know, better in government. I think that's changing slowly. There are some that are becoming more like the private sector, I think, um, in terms of just how results-driven they are and, and having a lot of staff that actually come from the private sector. So, so they're really you know, active and passionate about what they do, so people do tend to work more than they used to, but it's not necessarily expected, and there's a lot of support to, to get time off when you need it. You know, if you work on big projects during business periods, but you get that in the private sector too. There tend to be good training programs for staff that I've seen, a lot of good support for you know, people going back to do masters and PhD, like some of the students I teach here, and to do other training, you know, less formal training as well, still got their soft skills or whatever it may be. And also, I guess people don't often think about going back to the government sector. There's this option, or options to actually work in different different um, areas. You've got the whole finance sector, you've got intelligence, you've got you know, private security, you've got the immigration side, and you know, foreign affairs, you've got agriculture. There's so many different avenues compared to various public uh, private sector organisations. Sorry, that you, know, you can pick and choose and then move around. There's you know, a lot of commonality between some of the base work that you do and clearance that you often get, so you can transfer that around and work in different areas that from a lot of employees' perspective tends to be exciting and, and a great way to build their careers and that's something mm. I strongly encourage people to do, yeah. Mm. I agree and I do believe that uh, it is possible for the organisation to have an intention to do 
social goods and public goods, and the result of that is that profit will will follow as well. The question I have for you then is, this is a bit unusual. What do you think, aside from the training, what do you believe that is one thing that the commercial company could learn from the government agency and academy that they do well but not the commercial company? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, I think one of the key ones is being a bit more open to collaboration and sharing ideas and not be so worried about IP specifically, just to, to really think about the broader good of sharing you know, great insights and technologies and techniques that you develop with others and, and to think that you know, it improves everyone's lives ultimately and, and the work that you do and to be seen as a leader of excellence in that area rather than a protector of that information. I think, I think that's a big thing that can definitely learn. There's governance framework, especially when we transition now into questions around ethics and bias around AI and stuff like that that have you know, good governance around the data you use, how you use it. You know, on the government side, they're very strict about that. Obviously, protecting individuals' privacy and needs and, um, and just being held accountable by the public. I, I think that just gives them a different drive and incentive. But I think the industry, private industry can you know, take something away from that. I guess having freedom to, in some ways, to, to look at new ideas and, and, and research, and not to be always directly results focused, but have this ability and mindset to allow your staff to play around with ideas, test things out. I don't know some organisations have this, but I've seen many that actually don't. I think they can learn a lot from various parts of the government and academia where they just go from place to undertake new research and development and just, think, just have time to stop and think, you know, just what's coming around the corner, not just what are our current problems, but what's next, where are we going from here, and to try and develop a new, new technique. So basically it comes down to taking time to ask questions and to will be willing to collaborate with others to come up with innovative and great solutions. Yeah, I guess that's some of the key, key things I've seen that I think they could benefit from. I want to come back to the training of the next generation of the data scientist side. So in my experience, I have worked with the actuaries and the IT side. And in, in all those years, I find that the actuaries are good in balancing the business understanding, the statistical modeling, and the problem solving with the analytic solution. While the engineer from the IT side, they are stronger at the programming, but they seem to be behind in the understanding, the importance of understanding the business from the SME, the IT probably also tend to focus a little bit too much on the technology rather than the business. But at the same time, I do find that the actuaries tend to be shocked with the high expectation to the programming side. Given that you have worked with all of those people, what is your view on this? I think it's clear in most organizations that those capabilities are really needed. You need this analytics problem-solving capability that analysts, data scientists, actuaries have to bring. And you also need the IC where they you know, want to embed various solutions into a pipeline, especially into a production system. And both really need to have a strong business focus. Without that, I think things can go awry because, as I you know, mentioned earlier, the key focus is always to deliver strategic benefit to the organisation, do that from an analytics side from a data-driven perspective. But when I, if you talk about that enterprise analytics pipeline I mentioned, all these components are imperative to that. They all have an important role to play and they all... Ideally, it should you know, really work well together. You're right, actually, kind of a traditional balance tends to be surprised sometimes with the amount of coding that's required, especially when they transition into data science or data engineering fields. Um, but sometimes they don't realize just how imperative it is to actually have really strong coding skills and some kind of paradigms we find, find different approaches and software engineering practices. And they're often shocked, especially if they, they end up being embedded in the team within a production environment with the coding skills. You know, it could make a break that career, especially from the software engineering perspective. You need to keep up with newer techniques, things like you know, Docker, distributed systems, and that seems to be beyond what most of the analysts and actuaries that have learned and have been trained in, it's understandable. So it tends, some of them feel uncomfortable when, when some of that work goes beyond their standard fleet of tools that they're used to. So I think the key here is that it's really about upskilling actuaries and analysts being upskilled in you know, the coding and emerging technologies there. And the IT people just understand, having a better understanding of the models that you know their counterparts are, are producing, understanding the limits and how those models actually work. We well, need to update them and how that actually fit into the, the broader structure and pipeline that they're developing. So I think people just in general need to talk more, you know, be a bit more 
open to what the other person is doing and just collaborate. That's often the chief the chief side that lets organizations down not technology or anything specific you've got to people just not understanding what others are doing and not talking enough to one another and sharing their experiences. I truly believe in this notion of really sharing and empowering others and educating when you get a chance to mm. and just talking about what you're doing and being passionate. And that's where you come from, analytics to IT and getting others enthused and, and be willing to sit down with you and help you and, and learn from you. You know, some of the real keys there. So we seem to have different titles for all these different subjects, area, like whether they are known as quant, uh, quantitative analysis, or actuaries, or data scientists. But in my personal view, at a high level, I think they all share the same skill set and they want to easily transfer to another. Given that you have worked in all these three different areas, what are your thoughts on this subject? Like, do you really do you think they are the same, or what is the key difference? Of Sure, yeah, yeah, great point. I've yeah, had many people ask this in the past. I think in, in many ways, I think you could clearly argue that actuaries were actually the first of the original data scientists. I mean, they've been mm. flying their tra trade since the 17th century or so when they started looking at deterministic methods, managing life insurance, from what I remember. They tend to be often you know, stronger mathematics and statistically than, than some data scientists I've worked with, given their many years of rigorous training to become qualified. So they're extremely cluey, especially on the stats side. Um, and they tend to make great data scientists once they're happy to pick up more of the coding and upskill in various areas. I mean, just take my friend Nick Ryan, who's a shining example. He's one of the top data science influencers on LinkedIn and has a successful consulting and training business these days. So he started off in actuarial and, you know, setting up for a great career. The actuary, especially many that I've worked with, tend to use, you know, SAS and Excel and SQL. And some are familiar with R, but they're mainly doing the traditional work that they realize they need to really upskill in some of these newer techniques and, and coding languages and understand different paradigms. Even though they know that they're strong analytically, especially when it comes to problem solving, and that their business knowledge tends to be great, it's often the coding which they find to be the most challenging part in their transition. But there's definitely overlaps with the core students and data scientists there. And also, I guess, the mindset that they tend to be used to building complex and robust models, typically using a GLM, the generalized linear model which is you know, probability driven by um, probability distributions rather than the algorithm-driven models that data scientists tend to work with, you know, looking at large amounts of data, looking at structured and unstructured data. So feel a bit more uncomfortable when they first set off in data science. How do I actually work with unstructured data? What, this, what are some of the key concepts behind neural networks and, and other machine learning methods? It's quite different to what they're used to. So once they are still in that sector, they tend to be really strong. I've worked with actuaries in the insurance sector and helped in a number of them in the past to move into machine learning. It's actually one of the first times I got into machine learning for me and helping working with actuaries. And I found them to be really eager and talented. I found it really fun and overall we had a lot of successful projects in that space. Quant, in my experience, especially from having been one not many years ago, tend to be, I think, better prepared for this transition, especially if they've been spun up at once, rather than on the risk side, because they tend to typically need to develop models that are directly embedded in production systems as I did with that many, many years ago now. So they tend to have really strong coding skills along with a, with a broad analytics background, just by virtue of the, of the problems that you solve, the models you build, et cetera. And I've worked with you know, once in myself as a client across asset management, retail investment banking. So I was able to transfer a lot of these skills about learning, modeling, and production learning, coding, even stakeholder and business acumen and I'm directly into, you know, what's known as data science these days. Not everyone finds that transition easy though. It's really about upskilling in different parts where the strengths, the weaknesses may lie. No matter what domain you come from, you know, everyone has particular strengths and interests. Some people find coding more challenging, especially in development environments and looking at new approaches such as distributed systems. Others find the math and stats a bit more difficult to grasp. People coming in from a nice different background and a lot of their work is driven by algorithms. They struggle a bit more with really some of the deep master stuff concepts. They always struggle, but sorry, encourage them if they're struggling with that, but really trying to build up their fundamental skills in that space. Uh, most non data scientists need to become more comfortable, I think, with working with unstructured data these days. The two key components I encourage people to learn is not only working with unstructured data, so text, you know, video, audio data, which they're doing some of these areas they work in, the government or private sector, but also to become comfortable and understand how to deploy a lot of these models at scale, such as by distributed platforms. Many are used to doing modeling you know, on, a, on a smaller basis, doing maybe some dev systems, um, sorry, 
R&D systems, the ones that go into the dev environment are trying to build longer scale things, you know, become a bit different. So a lot of people can go down various formal and informal paths. They can look at online training or, you know, go back to do a master's or a PhD if they want. It really depends on what your skills and interests are and just finding where you can, where you, where you really need to and want to upskill. So there's a lot of overlap, as we just talked about, across, you know, actors, kind of attrition, data sciences. It's often the math stats or the, or the coding that tends to, to be lacking on one side or the other, given that all of them really need to have strong domain knowledge and that, you know, you just learn depending on where you go. Myself personally, having a background in math stats computing, and you know, it's kept me in the field of analytics throughout my career, and that I've really enjoyed. It's also made it a bit easier to transition into different aspects of that, which has given me the benefit of really focusing on and just learning the new business domains that I'm moving to rather than focusing on technical skills. So these core fundamentals are key for everyone and just looking at the fundamental transferable skills you have when you move between industries and just focus on that. And wherever you have maybe some weaknesses you'd like to build on and just yeah, look at creative ways to actually develop those further. So looking at this, from a distant perspective, as an employer, for those companies who want to build up the data analytic capability by hiring the data scientists or the client or the actuary into their team, what are the key attributes they should be looking for? I got asked this a lot, so I'm interested to hear your thoughts in this subject. In terms of what employers should look for within employees? Correct. When they yes. want to build up yeah, the yeah. analytic capability. Sure. Tell you some of the things that I tend to look for when I'm building teams. So I think it's probably common across many industries and domains. So one of the key things I like to focus on is just trying to gauge how deep is that fundamental understanding within an employee. If they're really quite strong on the math, stuff and coding, then I know that they can pick up these techniques. So maybe they've worked on various machine learning, traditional machine learning models like Main of Forest or decision trees, and maybe they haven't had an opportunity to look at you know some new NLP approaches through neural networks. Yeah, that's fine. Even if I'm doing a project on that, I know that given their, their background, they're most likely to be able to pick that up with the right training and mentorship. That's fantastic. Whereas if someone walks in who's already done some work in that field, but their fundamentals may be a bit shaky, um, I'm a bit more hesitant because I know that those skills won't be as transferable just down the line. We need to train a different model or I want them to focus on a, on a different approach. That's really, really key on the, on the technical side. It's, Often people, you know, focus on encoding R or Python or whatever. I, mean, I can understand where they're coming from, but I think the real important thing is that do they understand coding, the principles behind coding? It's really, I think, key. Do they understand different software engineering paradigms? I think that's important. Basically, like, for instance, do you understand relational coding like SQL? Do you understand imperative like C, object-oriented like C++ or Java, and in functional languages like Python? I normally... In a lot of the especially dev environments, I've worked in like the employees to be able to, to transition between the different paradigms to understand fundamentally how they work and when you use one over the other. Because then I know if there's a new language that we're going to develop in, say, Julia or something, that they'll have the, the strength and character to actually go in and build up the skills they need to get coding in that. We want to begin, it comes down to really understanding the fundamentals coding and that, 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 that carries people really far throughout their careers and that's fundamental. So I, I think people really need to, to, to um, work on that. On, on the soft skills side, I think communication is very, very important, especially if the staff members are going to be a liaison between business and parts of our team. I want them to be able to translate business problems into technical solutions and then be able to take those technical solutions and you know, project them to the results to the business using business jargon, not technical jargon. And we're there to solve business problems, but typically I want them to speak in business lingo, not technical lingo, unless they're within the team. And of course, that's the technical aspect. But the communication, both in written and verbal that is really important. People have had experience presenting at conferences, at various meetups and forums. People have set well when they're talking about something with me. It's something I'm always gauging and picking up on. And that is absolutely vital to a strong career as data scientists. I also think they need to have a passion to learn. Really question things. Why is something being done the way it's been done? You know, why are new approaches? And, and I think it's important to be a team player and be willing to help others, not only in your team, but beyond to, to be seen. As you're not just there as a you know, technical genius, but you're there as a trusted member of the organisation. You're there to help both business and tech people alike. So I want them to 
feel more like an you know, organisation employee rather than just a, a member of a big technical team. They're some of the key things that I think a lot of employers need to look at to really go beyond the highest level of data science and skills where they are. They understand at the core what are the fundamental skills and transferable skills they're building to a role and why do they want to work in that particular organisation, what's important about it. I think it's also important that that's two ways that, that employees understand the motivations of the employer and it's to look for various aspects as well. It has to be a two-way street. I mean, they have to understand that Mm. Not a vanity, vanity data science role, that actually data science is needed and rewarded and encouraged in that organisation. I strongly urge them to, to make sure that they're not just going to be micromanaged if they can find that out. <laughs> yeah. It's like quite living hell for many people with the data scientists. Typically, flatter hierarchies tend to work better when you have a lot of technical people. It gives them just more scope to, to talk to people they need to talk to rather than be bound by hierarchy. Um, the managers and leaders need to have and technical understanding themselves. I think in one of these teams, often where I've seen things break down is where the manager does, just doesn't have enough of a, of a technical background to, to be able to guide their team and to bring them the right projects and to support them. That's what's sometimes lacking. And they need to also understand that the data science is to directly work with the business and then to encourage that collaboration. They can't lock them away and, and be the conduit themselves. They need to really let them go out Converse with business, learn about the business and their pain points to really effective data scientists. Um, and also they support them in other ways to make sure they've got the right tools, the right hardware, and that they support innovation with that, that mentality of, you know, fail fast, fail cheap, so they can be creative and look at the research and build on them the scientific elements of those data science roles. So some of the key things I think are, are vital on, on both sides, employees and employers. I think we share a lot of our common view in this subject, but uh, I do want to move the focus of the interview to your research area. So currently you focus a lot on the confidential computing, natural language processing, NLP, and uh, graph analysis. So what makes you to decide to focus on this area? I guess two main reasons are interest and opportunity. Um, there's some of the prevailing issues I'm not of working in government industry. And they're just areas that I find really fascinating in terms of the underlying concepts involved and emerging research and, and techniques to solve some of these big problems. The government, from the government's perspective, there's a lot of fascinating and challenging problems, especially around privacy and security. That's where the confidential computing interest mm-hmm. originally developed um, and where a lot of the work is stems from. NLP, it's an area that I've seen really grow both in government industry. I, mean, you know, I think from where I once had a stack with around 80% of all data generated and structured either text or audio visual. So it's an area that has a lot of growth. Now I'm looking at attention mechanisms and applications of transfer learning and models like BERT and others, you know, ExcelNet. Like there's just some amazing development happening and a lot of really I guess strong problems that I've noticed in industry and government, which are complex and difficult to solve without advanced te- techniques and application of NLP. On the government side, again, if you're looking at intel and law enforcement, space where I've worked in, apart from NLP, there's a lot of really interesting work and need for graph analytics in some of the work and from there. So there's a lot of work that we're doing at the ANU, especially in collaboration with government industry and data one to come up with new techniques. And some of that's been really successful and really exciting, and, and there's some that we're still planning to develop for the next few years. And apart from that, I'm also looking at, at other areas, such as modern computing, which I find fascinating, given the mass stats and computing aspects of that. I think it's a growing area, and one that this person sounds really interesting to me. So I'm looking at yeah, delving further into that over the next year or two. Yeah, especially the mass math and physics part it goes back to my PhD study. So, yeah. Eager to dust off the cobwebs there and get back back into some of the more data theoretical stuff. So, for those who heard of this for the first time, can you please give a high level explanation of what is confidential computing and how important do you think it has in playing a role to convince the people and the government department that has got a lot of sensitive data moving into the cloud? Too? From the conversation I have with the people in the government, they often are reluctant moving to the cloud because of the concern of the privacy or the data breach. You're exactly right. And that's slowly changing, which is good to see. But yes, there are definitely concerns for legitimate reasons there. So confidential computing is really about having this ability to, to analyze 
and use data without actually seeing the without seeing the data itself. The key here is that it's become even more important to secure data of individuals and their privacy, especially for government agencies that trust with their data. Let's look at the Cambridge Analytica Analytica saga that occurred. Having techniques which allow us to basically keep the data hidden from the machine learning other models that sit on top of it is really key to success in that field. I think these techniques will play a huge role in helping data sharing, so between government agencies or government and private sector, until legislation can change or keep up with the to change and techniques that come out. Or until we're able to take a new ownership and control of the data as individuals. The, the two key components to confidential computing, as I think is it anyway, one is the privacy preserving record linkage part. So what you want to do is to be able to merge data from, say, two different databases and look at the commonalities between them. So you want to do that in a privacy preserving way so that the person doing the matching doesn't see the individual records um, in those databases, for instance. And then once you've done that, you want to be able to effectively um, encrypt that data. There's techniques to look at like homomorphic encryption or differential privacy or secure multi-party um, comparisons and stuff like that computations, which effectively means join the data, you find the commonality, you make sure the data is encrypted, so no one can see the, the raw data itself, and then you can go forward and do machine learning, risk profiling, etc. on top of that encrypted data. Homomorphic encryption is actually an incredible way to do that. It allows you to do computation over encrypted data, which is you know, quite mind-blowing, and there is variations on that, like partially homomorphic and some homomorphic, which, which limit the amount and the ability to do the additional multiplication. So once you can do those basic computations, you can then go forth and do um, various machine learning algorithms that fit on top of encrypted data. So as a very simple example, you can encrypt the numbers two and three, sum them up in ciphertext, the then when you decrypt them, you'll get the correct value, plain text value of five. So you end up doing your machine learning in encrypted space, which is really the key there. And this is, you know, paramount to being able to balance individual privacy with the ability to detect the term, disrupt crime fraud and other like terrorism clients, money laundering, et cetera. So I think it's really the key to, to really moving fast in a lot of these spaces and really improving our ability to detect crimes globally. And it's an exciting field to be working in it. How nearly is confidential computing? Is this still existed for a long time already, or is it rather new? It's been around for, for a while. However, some of these new techniques, like anamorphic encryption and variations of it, have become computationally feasible in the last maybe year or so. So some of the work that we partner with on Data 61 has been huge abilities to actually put a lot of these work into production. So it's becoming much more common, commonly used much more feasible, and I think you'll, you'll see in the next few years that it'll really grow in terms of what organisations are doing via some of these underlying techniques now that it's much more computationally computationally feasible and achievable, which is what we're going to do in the past. It sounds like computing power is going to be one of the challenges in the confidential computing because not only you have to process large amounts of data, but you also have to process all these data costs which are already Increases. So, computing power is going to be the bottleneck. But even that, if we are able to process all this in, in the cloud computing, then theoretically that should not be the problem. Would that be the right system? Computing power will help. The, the thing is, with some of these techniques, like the elements within music encryption, there are some that have been shown to provably be secure even against quantum attacks. So the power will help in terms of allowing us to apply a lot of these techniques but won't necessarily diminish the, the capability or the privacy that they ensure. So I think some of the best techniques we have now do ensure privacy against constant computing attacks, and I think that's the best we can hope for for now. So being able to implement methods that are you know, known to be secure against that, I think it's really the key and, to, and really where we should be putting a lot of our efforts there. Okay. The natural language processing is a really interesting subject. A friend of mine actually uh, started a company doing NLP and using NLP to help with the recruitment by screening the candidates. What is your focus in terms of research in this area? What sort of applications do you envision 
you could use NLP to help the copy factor. Yeah, that's quite open. I think there's a lot. There's a lot that we can discuss there. <laughs> 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 what is the one that interests you the most? Yeah. Maybe. So I'm happy to focus on some that we're looking at. So we're one of the agencies that we work with and I've worked with in the past, where they're looking at intelligence and detecting fraud and criminal behaviour. A lot of the information they gain from their partner agencies and from private industry that they work closely with, a lot of the key information they get is in unstructured format. They get some of the information through structured data, which is easy to pass and feed into machine learning algorithms. But some of the most vital information they get is in free text form. So they need to be able to come up with ways using emerging NLP and other approaches like, like trans- transfer learning to be able to, to pick up key information about potential cohorts of you know, bad people in some way doing questionable behaviour and, and to be able to do it in a, in a scalable way, in an automated scalable way, rather than depend on various analysts that do some of this work manually. So there's a lot of work going on with them in terms of looking at emerging techniques and trying to leverage the latest and greatest NLP methods to solve some of these huge problems. And I think it's going very, very well. And I think we'll continue to grow as new techniques come about and new challenges evolve. So that's been an exciting area to be involved with. And another one that I'm looking at, one of the other ones I'm looking at is also in cyber security. So looking at abilities to look at um, text-to-speech and machine translation in various areas in intelligence and to, once again, look at the absolute leading-edge techniques in NLP to, to drive insight in that area and to, to really test how good they are in practice and build up new systems that allow us to do some of these methodologies at scale and in real time. But without going into too much detail, I think it's fair to say that NLP will, will continue to grow and has a huge amount of capability and potential in both government and the private sector. And it's an area that I've seen a huge increase in the courses that I teach. The NLP course that I teach at not just undergraduate at master's level too. There's a lot of students that are keen to, to understand what's happening under the hood with these neural network approaches, for instance, and the machine learning, the masses that's behind it. And then also they want to try and transition directly into industry, but it's doing a slide where they can actually, you know, make an impact and difference if you're trying to be in the field and actually that I'm taking under my wing as the PhD students from next year that are the top of some of the other students that are already mentoring and supervising that area because they just find it fascinating seeing the potential and growth. So I think it's, it's an area along with graph analytics that will just continue to grow over the next um, year or two. Hmm. I think the NLP will help a lot in terms of the data area where in traditional this has never been quite possible for us to be able to do an analysis in that area. So, yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. agree with you. Um, for the next question, I would like to ask you about the choice of tools. And often I don't think that tools is the reason why we do analysis. Tools is also not the reason why it is considered analysis. And also with the advancement of the technology, newer and better tools, they do come out from time to time, especially when there is a major shift of the technology. And what I mean by this, for example, is a few decades ago, people would be still coding using C, and they have to worry about all the aspects of the coding, including how to handle the data and also how to build their own functions. Then later on, more tools are built, especially for the data management and the analytics. These days, most of these tools would even have a built-in model and library, hence one only have to call the library and use it without having to build everything from the scratch. However, at the high level, most of the tools, they are generally the same within their own era. But I mean, most of the tools, I mean, most of the tools from different vendors, they are generally the same. So what would be your advice for the organization to decide it is a time to upgrade the tool set versus a particular project they are having is actually just change of a vendor or just change of a tool that will never, or that, that doesn't yield a significant improvement. Yes, I think it's important to realize that tools are just a means to an end. For many organizations, I think that we've focused on that. I've been a, a big shift over, over my career. Many years ago now, I started off learning Pascal and you know, C and C++, 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 many different areas and domains where we've had to use you know, multiple tool sets to get a job done. 
my first time to office construction models and investment banking is pretty much broken with the model. So our model is being C++, so we then get into the structural system. The way the algorithm is implemented using the same numerical and recipes in C-book, where today data scientists can just you know, choose a multitude of libraries in R and Python to go and get that coding straight away. In general, I'm quite agnostic to tools. It really comes down to the best tool for the job, which can shift depending on the project you're doing or the task at hand. From an organisation perspective, I think it's best to really have a flexible, agile like infrastructure set up where they have a suite of tools available. And it's really important for the data scientists and analysts and software engineers to be able to choose what they need for the project. So in that, in that aspect, I think it's really important to have the analysts first rather than buy products from the vendor and get everyone to use it or force them to use it, which has been happening many times and often that's quite restrictive. There should be the analyst first, not the vendor or the tool itself. From a data scientist and other perspective, it's important for them to understand, as I talked about earlier, you know, understand different coding paradigms. We talked about relational authority of object oriented assessments. I think it's important for them to understand one tool and one language. To that beyond that is why different ones exist, what are their strengths and weaknesses, why would you use one over the other? I think that's really paramount. And apart from that, they really need to understand good software engineering practices. How do you actually use these tools? In the best possible way, they underneath understand basic concepts and code reuse principles, commenting of their code, unit regression testing, source control, code design, documentation, etc. You know, the standard paradigms you learn as you become a strong software engineer. So there's, there's that element. It's also moving with tech, with um, emerging technologies, working on production at scale. As I said earlier, being able to work at scale is really key and will really hold some organisations back. So understanding, you know, distributed databases, things like Spark and Scala can be the biggest challenge, but also you know, a huge plus and investment opportunity when organisations move down that path. It's all really important to really know how to use the different tools and then pick the best one at hand and also to, I guess, future-proof yourself in many ways so that infrastructure set up that lets you, you know, spin up an instance and do some research and dev, dev work using whatever tool or technique you want, having distributed systems to be able to do work at scale, you know, and you know, things run fast and efficiently being able to scale that up and adapt and, you know, have access to open source code alongside any vendor specific products that you may have or you know, may need to use for legacy reasons, whatever the case may be. So the flexibility, I think, is really key there and let it be driven by the business problems and what the, what the analysts need to use to solve rather than a specific vendor tool that is forced upon everyone. Mm. What has been your biggest highlight of your career so far, Alex? Biggest highlight? <laughs> <laughs> Fair question. Um, well, I guess from a, from a personal perspective, it, it's been, in many ways, being able to transition back into academia and being able to help students and, and many government industry partners to solve their problems. It's similar to work I did when I was helping lead the data science business for PwC, which was based across the whole federal government, so working with clients to really help people solve problems. So I always enjoy, enjoy doing work like that. In general, it's just helping people see the benefit of looking at their problems from a data-driven perspective. Um, there are many instances where, be, be it small projects, large projects, a lot of money at stake or not, it's just to look in people's eyes and they've realised the benefit and how much easier some of these techniques can make their lives and then drive their own value. As usual, I would end this interview by asking you the question, what is one book that you would give it to your younger self and why is that? There's many. Um, I read many books, so there's many that I could that I could um, draw upon. I guess one of the ones that has stood out over the last year or so that I've had a few discussions with people about is the book of why, what did they have looks at causality. I think it's an area that's fascinating. I think it's really important, especially from a data science perspective. I think, I think we need to all be cognizant of the development models, looking at causation and the impact it can have on developing new models, looking at you know, survey techniques that we apply in no matter what industry we're in, and just trying to understand the ramifications of that. I think it's one area that there is continuing, continual growth, and I think more people are becoming conscious of its importance, and hopefully there'll be a lot more awareness of, of it over time. So, causality, I think, yeah, learn about it and see how it impacts your industry. At least be aware of it, even if you don't use it directly. But the book is just a great read. It's very approachable, and some of the techniques that it talks about. I think beyond their time, so yeah, highly recommended. Can you see what, what people think of it as well? It's been great having you on our show, 
And thank you for, for this. Thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Jason.